Hello everyone. In this video, I would like to present a short introduction to convolutional neural networks, also known as CNNs or ConvNets. They are widely used in computer vision for tasks such as image classification, object detection, segmentation, and image generation. In this video and in the upcoming series of tutorials, I'm planning to focus on the classification use case of CNNs. So hopefully this is an intro to a series of programming tutorials in which I'll be trying to write a CNN in C++ from scratch. And what I mean by from scratch is actually without using anything other than what is available in the standard C slash C++ implementations. As for the theory behind, I don't think it's possible to cover everything in a single video, but I'll try to highlight some of the more important points. Artificial neural networks are supposed to mimic the behavior of the human brain. They are used for solving problems that are not so binary in their nature. They usually involve making predictions given some kind of input. A typical ANN consists of an input layer, one or more hidden layers, and an output layer. Depending on the complexity of a particular problem, the number of neurons or nodes in each layer will vary. From the point of view of computers, an artificial neuron is nothing more than a number, usually a floating point number. This number undergoes certain transformations and contributes in some way to the output of a neural network. On the slide you can see a simple example with three layers in total. A bias term in a neural network can be viewed as a neuron that is not attached to any of the previous layers, so it does not affect them during backpropagation. However, it is connected to all the neurons in the following layer. It essentially allows the network to move the output of a neuron to the left or to the right and thus provide a better fit. Biases are not to be considered another set of weights, but they allow the neuron to translate the area of influence to its activation state. Even though convnets are typically used with images, technically they could work with any number of dimensions. Therefore, for the sake of simplicity, here we can see a one-dimensional example of a CNN. The input layer is composed of five elements that share their weights with a hidden layer. It has one hidden layer, which undergoes a process known as max pooling. In this case, the greater value of two is selected and allowed to pass through to the next layer. The output layer, which essentially returns probabilities, is compared against target values during training. A typical convolutional neural network will have some form of input, usually a matrix or a stack of matrices representing an image. The input is then convolved with a set of filters, and the results are pulled afterwards to reduce the number of elements that go through to the next layer. The process can be repeated more than once, depending on the complexity of the input as well as the desired topology of the network. The layer just before the output one is usually flattened, the result of which is referred to as a fully connected layer. The final output contains the probability of the input belonging to a certain class. In the case of discrete convolution, the kernel, or here more specifically a filter, which is in fact the matrix, passes over the input matrix. In each of the locations the kernel goes to, its values are multiplied by the currently corresponding values in the input matrix. And the sum of the individual results is stored where the center of the kernel was. So for what we have in the picture, it would be 5 times 4 plus 2 times 12 plus 7 times 17 plus 8 times 28 and so on. If there is no padding included, the output matrix will be smaller than the input one. When we perform convolution, we obtain the same number of matrices as the number of filters in the given layer. For example, if we have five filters and three input matrices, we still obtain five resulting matrices. Individually, they may be smaller than the input ones, depending on the kernel size and on whether we apply some sort of padding or not. It is important to note that in image analysis and classification, we typically perform 2D convolution because filters are matrices, that is, two-dimensional entities. Weight sharing makes it possible to introduce sparsity into the network. For example, none of the synapses is rigidly connected to only two nodes or neurons, which greatly reduces the overall complexity. Instead, the synapses are able to connect more than just one pair of neurons, not simultaneously, but one pair at a time. 
This is particularly useful in the case of images, where we have to deal with multiple input neurons, each of which represents a pixel. The circular Gaussian function in 2D, that is with equal standard deviation, can be used for weight initialization in convolutional neural networks. This usually ensures a better start, since using pseudorandom values to populate filters may cause the network to fail to converge. It can also cause something that I like to refer to as leaking, that is, obtaining values that are not numbers, known as NANs, which, apart from rendering the network unstable, significantly slows it down. One of the most common activation functions in confluence is the ReLU function. ReLU stands for Rectified Linear Unit. It is a non-saturating function that is fast in terms of training with gradient descent, as it trains much faster than such nonlinear functions as hyperbolic tangent or sigmoid, which means a considerable performance boost in very deep networks. It is also believed to be a more accurate representation of how biological neurons work. One of its very few disadvantages is that the output is not zero-centered. Even though it is technically not differentiable at zero, its derivative at zero is assumed to be zero as well. Max pooling is the most common type of dimensional reduction in convolutional neural networks. After the input values have gone through a set of filters and an activation function, the maximum values are chosen for each part of the resulting matrix. The usual pooling window size is 2x2. Two two. This allows the most significant, or we could say the strongest, values to go through to the next step in the process. For example, if you look at the top right corner of the larger matrix, we have 8, 4, 1, and 3 there, so the selected value would be 8. Dropout is a simple regularization method used in artificial neural networks to prevent or to reduce a phenomenon called overfitting. Overfitting essentially occurs when, instead of developing a generalized model of the input, the network learns the training data to the point where it doesn't deal well with new, unseen data. The basic implementation of dropout is to set some of the neurons, sometimes even as many as 50%, in the particular layer to zeros, so that they do not contribute to the sums computed in the next layer. Applying dropout also helps to reduce the computational complexity by making the network sparser. In fact, max pooling can also be considered a form of dropout because a lot of the neurons in the rectified feature map are technically set to zero, except that it is not done completely at random, but is based on a specific criterion, that is, the strongest neuron in that case. Another activation function that is often used in the context of convenance is the softmax function. It adjusts the input elements in such a way that their sum is equal to 1. While sigmoidal functions are mainly used for binary classification, the softmax function is usually used for multi-classification problems. In that sense, it can be thought of as a generalization of the sigmoid. It is commonly used as the activation function for the output layer of a convolutional neural network, as it can be interpreted as the probability of an input image belonging to a particular class. Backpropagation is the process of adjusting the parameters of a neural network. This comes down to adjusting the weights and possibly biases in the synapses between the consecutive layers. In the case of convolutional networks, it is far more complicated than it is in the case of traditional neural networks. A transposed convolution, also called a fractionally strided convolution, aims to reconstruct the spatial resolution of the preceding convolutional layer. A transposed convolution involves convolving the input image or feature map with a gradient matrix acting as the convolution kernel. Why is the plus plus? Well, first of all, it's pretty fast, which is something to consider when you're writing a piece of software that is supposed to perform computational intensive tasks. Second, it gives you more fine-grained control over memory management. Yes, it is easier to make things break, but once you get the basic stuff down, it's usually all downhill from there. And since we don't have much already done for us, it will help us learn at a lower level. Third, I've already tried to write something similar both in C Sharp and in C++, so the end result should be better than it would be in a language I'm less familiar with. We'll most likely be doing it the header-only way, so templates. 
which will allow us to make it more flexible when it comes to input data types. So we're going to have four basic classes to help us store and deal with data slightly differently in different scenarios. First, we have the array class, which is the underlying class for the remaining three. It's going to have some methods that all of the child classes should have in common, for example, some element-wise transformations. The vector class could be used when we need to represent 1D data, for example, in the fully connected layer. Matrix is just what it sounds like, a 2D object with rows and columns. It can be used to represent an image. Finally, the volume class is basically a stack of matrices, so it can hold a set of filters, for example. Hopefully the application of each will get clearer and clearer as we go along. I think that's all for now. I know that I'm only scratching the surface here and I may have used some terms I didn't really get to explain, but it's mostly because of how huge this topic is and how many things there are to take into account. So I hope that as we go through each step together, anything that needs further explanation will be explained in the end. Thank you for watching. Comment, like, share, subscribe if you found this video useful so I can continue producing more content. See you around. Bye.